Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Thanks to uh, John and Jason and everybody here at Mentor Public Library for continuing to have us. Uh, we're on year, is it 10 or 11 of these programs now? I don't remember, but... Sorry, it's been here longer than me, so I... Yeah, yeah, well, that's true. I, I've, yeah, I was here at the beginning, but yeah, I think 2012 was the first year, so now that... So yeah, I guess this is technically year 11. So anyway, if you don't know, we're here every... Uh, second Wednesday of every month to do a talk on on some topic related to the Civil War. Obviously, I'm right down the street at James A. Garfield National Historic Site. A lot of times these programs have something to do with James Garfield. They don't always, uh, but they do always have something to do with the Civil War. So we appreciate the continued interest uh, from all of you to come and, and certainly the interest from our friends here at Mentor Public Library to continue to, uh, to have us here. So February, of course, is Black History Month, and so it seems a great time to uh, take a look at the, um, the experiences of the U.S. Colored Troops, uh, which is the official designation that was given to them during the Civil War. So as always, what you're going to get from me is you're going to get a lot of politics. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of how did we get to the point where we got to the Emancipation Proclamation, which, which allowed for the raising of, of regiments of African-American soldiers. We'll talk a little bit about the experiences of those, those soldiers during the war, and then we'll talk a little bit at the end about some of the legacies. And I'll give my usual disclaimer to you as well, which is, we have, you know, 45 minutes here together or whatever. So by necessity, this is a very cursory <laughs> look at a very deep, rich topic that you could do an entire, you know, graduate school seminar on. So you're going to get just the highlights from me here over the next 45 minutes or so. But there are plenty of excellent books, both here in the Mentor Public Library and, and, and from outside repositories or bookstores that you can go to uh, and, and to learn more about uh, the experiences of the U.S. Colored Troops during the Civil War. So again, this is a quick kind of, you know, hitting, the, hitting you with the highlights, I guess you would say, about US, the U.S. Colored Troops, but there's lots more information out there. So uh, at any rate, let's uh, dive right in. So what is the situation prior to the Civil War and prior to the raising of African-American regiments of soldiers? So we, of course, have to talk about, kind of set the stage for, you know, how did this war even come about in the first place? So here in antebellum America, you know, prior to the Civil War, by the time the Civil War was getting really close, say the late 1850s or so, we have about uh, four million enslaved people held in bondage in the United States. Um, and about 25% of white Southerners were what we would think of as slave owners or owners. They were enslaving uh, uh, African American people. We tend to think of all uh, people who owned slaves or enslaved people as, you know, large plantation owners, gone with the wind, right? You know, uh, Scarlett O'Hara and all this stuff. Or uh, more recently, um, the, the, the Django Unchained, and I don't know if anyone saw that, it was a Quentin Tarantino film. Um, where uh, Leonardo DiCaprio plays this, this role as this guy who owns this huge plantation and has you know, hundreds and hundreds of enslaved people on the plantation. So that's kind of what we think of when we think of uh, slavery prior to the Civil War. But in fact, uh, those were really more the, the exceptions than the rules. The vast majority of people who, who owned enslaved people prior to the war owned a much smaller number than that. Um, so, uh, you know, about 25% of, of whites in the South were what we would think of as slave owners, but the vast majority of those did not have huge plantations. They had smaller farms where they might enslave, you know, two or five or ten people uh, rather than, you know, the hundreds and hundreds you would see in Gone with the Wind or Django Unchained or, or something like that. So those really huge plantations were, were, were not all that common. They were certainly concentrated in, in certain parts of the country, primarily in the Deep South, uh, but that was not really was the, um, the reality of American slavery. Now that, of course, does not mean that it wasn't, it was any less brutal or, or, uh, or offensive an institution among you know people who owned a smaller number of other human beings but just so you kind of have a sense of what what uh, hu american enslavement actually looked like cotton of course was the the primary cash crop uh in the south cotton's popularity had grown in the decades leading up to the civil war um, and, and to the point where by the time we get close to the Civil War, it's, you know, it's referred to as King Cotton for a reason, and that is it is the, 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 the primary cash crop of the South. 
So cotton brings in, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars for southern, uh, southern farmers and plantation owners. But the thing about cotton is it's a very labor intensive crop. It takes a lot of work to plant it, to tend it and to harvest it. So as cotton increases in popularity as the South's primary cash crop, that also means that the number of enslaved people continues to rise because the more cotton you're planting and tending and harvesting eventually to sell, both to the North uh, and to, to other countries, primarily uh, the British were, were huge consumers of Southern cotton, uh, but the more cotton that, that is being grown, the larger number of laborers, in this case enslaved people, you need to, to, to grow and tend that crop. So as cotton grew in popularity and became the South's primary cash crop, that also led to a market increase in the number of enslaved people, but also the monetary value of enslaved people as well. This is, these are just a couple of good maps that show you where cotton was truly king. Um, the, the yellow swath on that first map there is showing you where cotton was primarily grown. So yellow is cotton, again, the primary cash crop of the South. Uh, blue is corn, red is tobacco. Um, so you see where some of these, uh, these particular crops were popular, but as you can see, <laughs> yellow is by far the, the largest, uh, the, largest the, the most represented color there. So that shows you uh, not only the, the, the popularity of cotton, but again, this, then this map corresponds to show you uh, the red dots there are the, it is coded as distribution of slave population. So as you can see, you know, it does kind of correspond where cotton is being grown and harvested versus where in, enslaved people are primarily, are primarily held. <clears throat> so now we get into the politics a little bit, uh, which lead to the Civil War. And I do think it's important to understand these things. And again, this is a very, very quick look. But the Missouri Compromise of 1820 is, um, is the, the legislation that basically does a couple of things. First of all, it allows Missouri to come into the Union. Missouri wanted to enter the Union as a slave state, meaning a state that had slavery within its boundaries. This was at the time in history when Congress had kind of come to this sort of unofficial balance of power, uh, this unofficial agreement to every time a new slave state comes into the Union, then a corresponding new free state has to come into the Union as well. So we always have the same number of, of, uh, of, sla of states that have slavery and states that do not. So in this case, they hacked off part of New England up here that it had, it had belonged to Massachusetts and they called it Maine. So they let Maine into the, country, into the Union as a free state and they allowed Missouri to come in as a slave state. But this line that you see here, this 36 degrees, 30 minutes north, that became a geographic boundary. Anything above that line, with the exception of Missouri, of course, Slavery was, was not permitted. Most of, almost all of these northern states had long outlawed slavery at this point. They did, not have, they, still, they did not have legal slavery within their boundaries by this time. Anything below that 3630 line, and that line extended, it's an imaginary line that extended all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. Anything below that line, slavery would be technically permitted. So we have a geographic boundary established. And that actually held for a, for, for a few decades. Uh, you know, everybody kind of adhered to that until 1854. So 34 years later, we have the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So this act should have been extremely boring and uncontroversial. It was basically a, uh, a piece of legislation introduced really to, to, to allow for the territorial organization of Kansas and Nebraska. Nebraska was obviously a lot bigger then than it is today, but uh, it, was, it was intended to, to territorially organize these two territories. But the kicker with the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which was introduced by a guy named Stephen Douglas, who was a, a U.S. Senator from Illinois, the kicker here was that Douglas wrote into that legislation that whether or not Kansas and Nebraska would allow slavery within it, their boundaries would be based on what he called popular sovereignty. In other words, people would vote on it. Now that sounds great, right? I mean, this is America. We believe in democracy. One man, one vote. If, sorry, it was all men at that point. So one man, one vote was technically accurate. Today we would say one person, one vote, of course. But uh, the, the only problem is if you, let me go back. Remember 
the Kansas Nebraska area. Look at where Kansas and Nebraska are located. Now let me go back to this map and tell me what you see. They're both north of the 3630 line. Okay, so that means that in effect, the Kansas Nebraska Act of 1854 repeals the Missouri Compromise. Slavery is now possible in territories that are above that 3630 line. Okay, so the Kansas Nebraska Act, which again should have been very boring and very non controversial, suddenly opens this floodgate of anger and, and emotions on both sides of, of the argument about slavery. And it also leads to a very important political event, which is the birth of the Republican Party. So at this point, the two primary American political parties were the Democrats and the Whigs. Forget what you know about these parties today. Forget about who you think is liberal or conservative or any of this stuff. In the 1850s, the Democrats are the conservatives. The Democrats are the ones most aligned with Southern interests. The Democrats are the ones who are, for the most part, pro-slavery, pro-white supremacy. The Whigs, <laughs> the Whigs are a mess. And the Whigs basically kind of fall apart at this point because they just can't come up with a really good, cohesive response to the Kansas-Nebraska Act. The Whig Party was on, its, was on death's door anyway because it was you know, largely uh, ineffective and, and, and inefficient at, at this point. So the time was ripe for a new political party anyway. And that party ends up being the Republicans. And they are founded as a direct result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. People like Abraham Lincoln recognized immediately the Kansas-Nebraska Act is a repeal of the Missouri Compromise. That cannot be allowed to happen. So a new political party is created. That is the Republican Party. So the Republicans at this time are what we would think of as like, you know, the progressives, or if you want to use modern terms, the liberals, if you will. So the, 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 the Republicans are the, are the more progressive party, whereas the Democrats are the more conservative party at that point. Obviously, these things are all very different today, but just that's what we're looking at here in the 1850s and 60s. Lincoln, of course, is a lawyer at this point in, in Springfield, Illinois. He'd been in a number of elected positions. He'd been in the Illinois uh, legislature for a while. He'd been a uh, one-term congressman back in the 1840s. Uh, and he had kind of decided that yeah, he was done with politics. He was going to concentrate on being a lawyer and, and enjoying his, his life and making lots of money, which he was doing. But the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the rise of the Republican Party really pull him back into politics. So a few years later, by 1858, he's now running for the U.S. Senate from Illinois against Stephen Douglas, the guy who wrote the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And it was when he was accepting that nomination to run for the Senate in 1858 that he made his very famous house divided speech. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect it will become all one thing or all the other. So you, or uh, I'm sorry, it will cease to be divided. You've heard this speech before, a very, very famous speech. Now, Abraham Lincoln, of course, doesn't win that election in, in 1858. He's nev he never becomes a U.S. Senator from Illinois, but he gets something out of that election that's even more important than a Senate seat, which is he gets national exposure. People start looking at him as a potential 1860 Republican presidential candidate, and in fact, he does run for president in 1860. So you have Lincoln, the Republican, there on the, uh, on the far left. Um, the Republicans at this point are not a party of abolitionists. Okay, it's important to keep that in mind. It, people want to simplify these issues and they're so complicated. You can't, you can't simplify these issues. There were abolitionists in the Republican Party, but the party itself was concerned about the expansion of slavery, not the abolition of slavery. Lincoln himself was not an abolitionist at this point. He didn't like slavery. He was morally opposed to it and, and had been since at least the 1830s. But he said at this point he didn't see a constitutional mechanism to abolish slavery in the places where it already existed, meaning in the South. What Lincoln and the Republicans were saying at this point was, we can't allow slavery to expand. And we think constitutionally we can prevent that. So that's Lincoln's platform, and that's the Republican platform in 1860. And then you have the Democratic Party, which kind of, you know, shoots itself in the foot by splitting, basically. Stephen Douglas, who had just run against Lincoln two years earlier for the Senate, is the Northern Democratic candidate, 
supporting popular sovereignty. John C. Breckinridge over here on the far right, who becomes eventually a Confederate general, is the Southern Democratic candidate who says the government must protect slavery and let it expand. And then the kind of the, uh, the, the middle ground between those two is this guy, John, C John Bell, right here, who is the third party, if you will, candidate in, in 1860 with the Constitutional Union Party, where, which basically says the union as it is right now, status quo, the government protects slavery, uh, but also keeps the union together. And of course, we all know what happens in 1860. And you don't need a poli sci degree to, to determine that, hey, it's really hard to win an election when, you're, when your voters split off into three different categories. All the Republicans, or almost all of them, voted for Lincoln. The Democrats were split among Douglas, Breckinridge, and even Bell. So of course, even though he only gets about 40% of the popular vote, Lincoln wins the election because he's able to win the Electoral College. So the red states you see there are the states won by Lincoln. The green states are the ones won by Breckinridge, the Southern Democratic candidate. The kind of orange here, if you can make the difference from that far away, uh, are the ones that are won by, uh, by Bell, the Constitutional Unionist. And then the Northern Democrat is, uh, is Douglas, who wins Missouri and part of New Jersey. So Lincoln, of course, becomes president uh, in this election. That, of course, leads Southerners to say, we're out. We give up on the Union. Lincoln is just a damned black Republican. And Republicans only care about one thing, and that is abolishing slavery. Now, never mind that Lincoln had said a million times, that is not what we're saying. We're saying we don't want slavery to expand to the territories. Nobody has the constitutional authority to abolish slavery, at least not at this point. So Lincoln had said that many times, and he said it again even in his inaugural address. But Southerners decided they didn't, they didn't like the results of an election, so they decided to, to rebel against the federal government. Uh, and so uh, you know, Lincoln continued to say they're misunderstanding us, they're, they're misinterpreting our position. We are not saying that we are abolishing slavery. We are saying we don't want it to expand. And then on December 20th of 1860, of course, South Carolina becomes the first state to secede from the Union. So here's uh, a, a passage from Lincoln's inaugural address, his first inaugural in 1861. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without your being yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. So once again, Lincoln is saying, we're not going to attack you. You cannot have a fight unless you start it. And of course, that's exactly what the South does. On April 12, 1861, Confederates fire on Fort Sumter. That's the beginning of the Civil War, and that changes everything because now we have a rebellion, an insurrection, call it whatever you want. Things have now significantly changed, and Lincoln now sees a much larger role for himself as president, a much larger role for the executive branch, uh, and a much stronger hand in dealing with the rebellion itself, but also setting the agenda for the future of the country for whenever this war finally ends. Now, so we get to, you know, of course, the war starts in 1861. Uh, a lot of you are, are interested in the Civil War. You know that, you know, the first year or so is not great for the Union, at least in the Eastern Theater, where most people are concentrating their attention. Uh, you know, Lincoln is already starting to go through all of these generals and, you know, hiring and firing all these generals, trying to find somebody who'll do what he wants them to do. As far forward as August of 1862, Lincoln is still saying that our primary focus here is preserving the Union. However, Lincoln has already started thinking in his mind, we cannot put this country back together with the primary thing that we're fighting about, slavery, still in place. It's not going to work. All it's going to do is guarantee that we fight again, whether it's in 5, 10, 20 years, whatever. So Lincoln is already starting to think about ways to, in fact, get rid of slavery which he now feels he can do because everything has changed with, the, with, uh, with Southerners seceding, but also uh, starting, this, starting this war. So on August 22, 1862, he writes this very famous letter 
to uh, Horace Greeley, who's the editor of the New York Tribune. Uh, Greeley had kind of written this sort of scathing editorial um, about Lincoln in the uh, in the in the paper and so Lincoln is responding here basically to that and he says again as far forward as August of 1862 my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery if I could save the Union without freeing any slave I would do it and if I could save it by freeing all the slaves I would do it and if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone I would also do that what I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because I believe it helps save the Union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. Great answer, right? It's a little disingenuous on Lincoln's part, and in a good way as far as I'm concerned, because he has already written the Emancipation Proclamation. It is literally in his desk drawer or sitting on the top of his desk as he writes this letter. Lincoln had decided by the summer of 1862 that if the Union wins this war, we cannot put the country back together with slavery intact. It's not going to work. So he had written out the Emancipation Proclamation, and he had presented it to his cabinet, saying, I think this is what we need to do. And the cabinet, for the most part, agreed with him, but... Uh, a number of them, including William Henry Seward, who was the Secretary of State, implored him to don't issue it now. Wait until we have a good, uh, significant military victory behind us so it doesn't look like a desperate act. So let's, you know, it's a good idea. We should do it, but let's wait until the right time. And Lincoln agrees. It's good advice. It's good advice. So as he writes this letter to Horace Greeley, uh, in August of 1862 saying I don't really care about slavery I'll do whatever I need to do to save the Union he also knows in fact he is going to abolish slavery it is going to happen now let's talk a little bit about some of the precursors to the US colored troops uh, we have three major pieces of legislation here we want to just just touch on very briefly uh, the two confiscation acts, one in 1861 and one in 1862. The first one permits confiscation of any property being used to support the Confederacy. And enslaved people are considered property because remember, Southerners themselves called enslaved people property. Us having slavery as Southerners is a property right because these people are property, are our property. So when the government passes the Confiscation Act of 1861 saying we can, we can seize any property that's supporting the Confederacy, that includes enslaved people. So the, the, the federal government can seize enslaved people and take them away from, from, from Southerners. And then in the, the second Confiscation Act in 1862, it, that actually freed enslaved people. This is a precursor to the Emancipation Proclamation, but it actually freed enslaved people whose owners were in open rebellion against the United States. So uh, Confederate military officers, Confederate political leaders, these types of things, uh, anybody like this who, who was actively engaged in rebelling against the United States, the, the Second Confiscation Act freed any enslaved people owned by, by folks in, that, in those categories. And then the Militia Act of 1862 empowered the president to use formerly enslaved people in any capacity in the army. So this allowed, for example, uh, you know, former, uh, formerly enslaved people to become laborers or teamsters or this kind of thing for the army. They weren't quite, re they weren't quite at the level of being soldiers under the Militia Act, but of course, obviously, we're, we're getting there. So these are precursors to what eventually allowed for the, for the recruitment of, of African-American soldiers. So we get then to the Battle of Antietam, which we've talked about in this program series in the past, uh, September 17th of 1862. Uh, this is a major, major battle in Maryland. Uh, this was uh, the Confederate, uh, Confederate General Robert E. Lee's first invasion of the North. Uh, he was trying to take the war out of Virginia for a while, uh, and he was planning to move up into Pennsylvania, but he was stopped at, uh, uh, in Maryland at uh, what, what Northerners call Antietam and what Southerners call Sharpsburg. This is the single bloodiest battle, uh, one-day battle uh, in American history. 23,000 casualties in, the, in about 14 hours of fighting. That's 23,000 total. That's both sides. Uh, but it is, it is considered tactically kind of a draw. Uh, 
Um, you know, positions didn't change all that much. By the, the end of the day, you know, a lot of the troops were kind of still pretty much in the same place where they'd been, even though they'd been, you know, uh, slugging it out for, for well over 12 hours. But strategically, it is a union, a union victory because when this battle is over, eventually Robert E. Lee and his army turn around and go back to Virginia. So it is considered a strategic Union victory, and it is the victory that Lincoln is waiting for that allows him to finally issue the Emancipation Proclamation. So five days after Antietam, on September 22, 1862, Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation, which basically puts the Union on a footing of now fighting to abolish slavery. So for almost two years, at, you know, or for a year and a half at this point, the Union has said it is fighting to preserve the Union and keep the Union together. That changes as of September 22nd, 1862, when Lincoln issues the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. So what he does is he issues the proclamation and says it will take effect on January 1st. So, hey, Southerners, you have three and a half months to come to your senses and surrender, and maybe we can work this out. But if you're still in open rebellion against the United States on January 1st, this will go into effect, and then the Union is fighting not only to save the Union, but also to abolish slavery. So we have all the language here saying that, you know, of course, it, it's going into effect on January 1st. All persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion, shall thenceforward and for, be forever free. Famous, you know, famous words from the Emancipation Proclamation, but for our purposes today, talking about the U.S. colored troops, the part that's really important is italicized and underlined here at the bottom. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. So the Emancipation Proclamation does two things. It not only puts the Union on a footing of fighting to abolish slavery, it also allows for the recruitment and acceptance into military service of African American soldiers and sailors. So this is the mechanism by which we have really the creation of the US colored troops. So. Uh, this is, you know, this is just a, a letter from Lincoln that I like that he wrote to a friend of his back in Illinois in August of 1863. As Lincoln expected, a lot of Northerners were very upset about this. They, they had said all along, we're not fighting to, to, to free enslaved people. We're fighting to preserve the Union. And up until the Emancipation Proclamation, Lincoln was saying the same thing. Now, in their mind, Lincoln has made this very sudden turn. Really, it wasn't that sudden of a turn, if you know where Lincoln was on this. But to everyone else it seemed like you know something of a, of a sudden turn from from Lincoln so this friend of his James Conkling had written to Lincoln you know kind of this scathing letter about you know why he was getting involved with abolishing slavery and Lincoln responds you say you will not fight to free Negroes some of them seem willing to fight for you but no matter fight you then exclusively to save the Union I issued the proclamation on purpose to aid you in saving the Union whenever you shall have conquered all resistance to the Union. If I shall urge you to continue fighting, it will be an apt time then for you to declare that you will not fight to free Negroes. So basically Lincoln is saying the Emancipation Proclamation is there to help preserve the Union. It is there to, you know, set us on a footing that allows us to not only do what is morally right, but also gives us the tools we need to win the war. And, you know, I mean, the Union desperately needs more soldiers, more sailors, and this is a mechanism to do that. And so here's this friend saying, I'm not fighting to free enslaved people. And Lincoln is saying, fine, you fight for whatever reason you want. But, you know, if, if we win the war, then you can say you're not fighting to free, to free enslaved people. But until then, that's what we're fighting for. Of course, uh, Frederick Douglass, who, who knew Lincoln and, and, uh, and, and knew James Garfield, too, by the way, uh, and worked for, uh, worked for James Garfield, even. Um, Douglass, of course, had long been advocating for the recruitment of African-Americans to fight in this war. I mean, after all, 
who really had more to win or lose, as the case may be, than, than African Americans in, in, in this conflict. So Douglas says, you know, this is a great quote, once let the black man get upon his person the brass letters US, let him get an eagle on his button and a musket on his shoulder and bullets in his pocket. There is no power on earth that can deny he has earned the right to citizenship. So Douglas, of course, is not only advocating for the use of African Americans as soldiers and sailors, he's also looking toward the future, toward the time when the war is over. And hey, if the black man has fought for his own freedom, how can you deny him citizenship? So it's a, it's a very powerful, uh, powerful quote. So after uh, the, um, the Emancipation Proclamation, of course, does go into effect on January 1st, the Confederacy does not magically uh, uh, decide to surrender between September of 1862 and January 1st of 1863. So once the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect, then the government had to actually go through the process of starting to recruit and enlist uh, black men as soldiers and sailors in the U.S. Army and Navy. Um, General Orders number 40, 143 of, of May 22nd, 1863 is the mechanism that actually allows the government to start, uh, start doing this. Um, and designated, it designates African American regiments as the quote unquote US colored troops. So that's where that name comes from. That's not a name I made up. That's the actual name of the, uh, that was given to these, these, these units uh, by General Order number 143. Now, uh, the US colored Troops units were primary, were almost always led by white officers. Um, you know, there these were not. <laughs> despite the fact this is this is a huge breakthrough moment in our history, um, it is not a perfect moment, and there's really very little uh, opportunity for for African American soldiers to advance in rank. Uh, there were very few. Uh, there were some, but very few commissioned officers uh, who were African American. So, uh, primarily white uh, white troop or white uh, officers rather. Uh, commanded U.S. colored troops units. So you can see this is a, obviously a, a group of, of, of African-American soldiers, but on the far left there you see a white, uh, probably a, a colonel or something like that in charge of this, uh, in charge of this regiment. <clears throat> Eventually about 175 regiments are raised. This is you know, a, a very significant number of soldiers. Uh, and really, really important to the Union's eventual victory. The, you know, these were huge contributors to the Union's victory. Uh, there were regiments that were infantry, cavalry, engineers, light and heavy artillery, the difference being the, 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 the size and style of, of artillery pieces that they used. Uh, and U.S. colored troops were, re were, were recruited in all of the Union states, and we'll see here in a second, uh, a, a few southern states as well because there were certainly plenty of African Americans in southern states who were very, very eager to fight for the Union and against the Confederacy, no doubt about that. In all, about 180,000 uh, black men served in uniform, that's the Army and the Navy. Um, by the time the war ended in 1865, uh, U.S. colored troops were about a tenth or so of un Union forces, so a pretty sizable, uh, pretty sizable chunk of, of Union forces there. Uh, U.S. colored troops lost about 3,000 casualties in battle, but really over 68,000 total, because keep in mind, this is true for, for white and black soldiers in the Civil War, disease is a much more uh, deadly killer than battle during the Civil War. You know, you have guys living in these camps where, you know, there's, there's not very much knowledge of or, or adherence to any kind of sanitary standards. You know, so guys are, you know, using latrines that are, you know, right next to where they go eat and this kind of stuff. So people get sick uh, with dysentery and diarrhea and all kinds of really, really awful uh, illnesses that were just very prevalent in these camps. So disease killed far more soldiers in the Civil War than, than battle. Um, but we have about 68,000 or so uh, U.S. colored troops who, who died during the Civil War, primarily from disease, but from battle as well. <clears throat> uh, so we had, uh, we had um, primarily infantry. Uh, U.S. colored troops were primarily infantry, about 135 infantry regiments. We have regiments of cavalry, light artillery, heavy artillery, uh, and then, of course, some other independent units uh, as well. So, you know, there were some, some uh, there were engineers, for example, engineer units, that kind of thing. And so there were all different kinds of, uh, of, of regiments that U.S. colored troops were, uh, were assigned to and that they, they worked in. And it's true, you know, initially there were, um, uh, there was obviously 
you know, from day one, there was a lot of prejudice against African-American soldiers in the Union forces. Uh, there were also cases in, in um, where, you know, Confederates, uh, Southern, Southern troops basically, you know, they had orders issued to them saying that, you know, if, if, if any color, U.S. colored troops are captured, they should be executed. Um, and Lincoln eventually then responded by saying, okay, fine, if you want to play that game, we'll play that game too. So we're going to start executing Confederate prisoners as well. Um, because these, you know, these, these soldiers are to be treated as soldiers. Uh, and, and so, um, so, but, you know, the, it was not as if suddenly on January 1st, 1863, uh, all the Union troops were, were just really, really accepting of African-American soldiers. I wish that was the case, but it, it was not. Um, so there were plenty of there was plenty of prejudice against against U.S. colored troops even in northern uh, in, in in northern forces and and initially at least a lot of these units were put on kind of um, labor duty you know they were digging trenches and things like this it wasn't until a little bit later on that they actually were were uh, engaged heavily in in actual fighting. <clears throat> There also were a few uh, regiments that were, were kind of starting to be formed even really before General Order Number 143 established the U.S. Colored Troops. So there were, you know, and, and these, of course, were, uh, were all from, uh, from uh, New England states, you know, uh, the, the extreme north where, where abolitionism was, was, you know, kind of at its... At its um, was was most popular and that there were a significant number of free african americans uh living in those areas so there were some some state units formed as well that eventually kind of were rolled into u.s colored troops um, the most famous of these obviously is the 54th massachusetts that stormed fort wagner in july of 1863 if you've ever seen the film glory that's the regiment that's depicted in in the film um, this is by far the most, the most famous uh, African-American uh, regiment of, of U.S. colored troops. And of course, the, uh, the film Glory, you know, follows, um, of course, several of the white officers who are leading the 54th Massachusetts, but then also some of the African-American soldiers as well, portrayed primarily by uh, the Denzel Washington character and the Morgan Freeman character as well. So, but yeah, the, uh, the 54th Massachusetts is, of course, the most famous um, regiment of, of U.S. colored troops. Now, we also had some U, uh, U.S. colored troops regiments raised in the South. The most famous of these is the, the Corps d'Afrique, the, 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 the first Louisiana Native Guard. So this, these were formed, these groups were formed in, in New Orleans uh, after the Union captured the city. That was back in 1862. So you had free black men and formerly enslaved black men who were eager to fight for the, for the Union and, and put an end to the Confederacy and put an end to slavery. Uh, and so they joined up with the, the first Louisiana uh, Native Guard. Again, infantry, engineers, artillery, they, you know, they kind of ran the gamut. Uh, a lot of these units were then also later rolled into some of the larger uh, U.S. Colored Troops units. And actually some of them even got redesignated from, you know, the 1st Louisiana to, you know, the 31st U.S. Colored Troops or, or whatever the, the, the designation was. But anyway, there were even, uh, there were even some, uh, obviously some uh, uh, U.S. Colored Troops recruited in, and, uh, and raised in, in the South. As far as battles in which the U.S. Colored Troops participated, there are many. Uh, these are some of the most notable. Uh, Island Mound, Missouri, that's October of 1862. Again, before the final Emancipation Proclamation is issued, uh, bef long before General Order Number 143, you have a number of escaped uh, enslaved black men uh, sort of volunteering to fight for this, uh, what they called the first Kansas colored volunteers, because of course Missouri and Kansas are right next to each other. And so you had a number of, of, of formerly enslaved people fighting in this battle as, the, as part of this Kansas unit. Vicksburg, of course, is a famous one. Of course, Grant you know, takes Vicksburg on July 4th, 1863. Um, which is the day after the Union also wins the Battle of Gettysburg. So July 1863 is, a, is kind of a turning point for, uh, for the war, for the North's war effort. Fort Wagner, of course, I already mentioned, that's the 54th Massachusetts. That's what you see at the, uh, at the end of glory when they uh, storm uh, uh, Fort Wagner. And then the Battle of Nashville, uh, December of, of 1864, kind of coming on towards the end of the of the war. And then down at the bottom there you see a, a great quote from Grant uh, talking about the use of U.S. colored troops at Vicksburg. 
where he says, Negro troops are easier to preserve discipline among than our white troops. All that have been tried have fought bravely. So there's, there's uh, you know, the guy who eventually be soon became the, the highest ranking general in the entire Union Army and then later became the president of the United States advocating for, for the larger use of, of U.S. colored troops. Uh, the Battle of the Crater uh, is, is arguably even more famous than uh, the Battle for Fort Wagner. Uh, this is July of 1864. This is part of the larger Union siege around Petersburg, Virginia. So, you know, by this time, Grant had been brought to the east by Lincoln, and he's commanding all Union forces, and he's now fighting in, you know, in Virginia against Robert E. Lee. And Grant has adopted this strategy of basically a war of attrition where, hey, you know, we have more men than, than the South, so we can afford to lose more men, so we're going to just continue to throw men at Lee until until he's beaten and that's exactly what they did so this union siege around petersburg uh lasted for months and months and months um, here in july of 1864 uh, one of the officers of one of the the northern regiments was a coal mining engineer from from northeastern pennsylvania and he got this idea to dig a tunnel basically under like a mine shaft dig a mine shaft under the confederate forces and lay this huge mine and blow it up and and that would be kind of the uh, that would that would take care of those confederates um, they did in fact do this they dug this mine they set off this uh, they dug this mine shaft and they set off this huge uh, bomb basically a giant mine under the uh, under the confederate forces uh, and then assaulted the confederate forces and actually a division of, of u.s colored troops led the assault into the crater uh, the Confederates ended up repulsing this attack. This is actually a Confederate victory. Um, but you see a great piece of art here on the left. I think that's a, maybe a Don Troiani, I think, uh, uh, the artist of that piece, uh, depicting uh, African-American soldiers fighting. So you see, you know, you see the, the American flag there on the right, and then in the middle you see the Confederate flag kind of coming at them. So the Confederates did actually win this, uh, did, did win this battle and, and killed a lot of U.S. colored troops in that battle. And then uh, another very famous and, and, and really kind of savage uh, battle involving U.S. colored troops was in Tennessee at Fort Pillow. Uh, that was April of 1864. So this was, a fort, this was north of, uh, of Memphis, about 40 miles or so north of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Union forces captured this fort in, uh, in 1862 and held it. Uh, and, and for almost two years, and then in April of 1864, Nathan Bedford Forrest, the future, one of the future founders of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, Forrest kind of goes on this uh, sort of raid, this larger raid, and one of the things that he does during this raid is he decides to recapture Fort Pillow. So Confederates under Forrest attack Fort Pillow on April 12, 1864. There were a number of U.S. colored tr uh, troops, regiments, uh, as part of the garrison at Fort Pillow. They were overrun, and then when those, when those soldiers, those African-American soldiers, tried to surrender because they'd been overrun, uh, Confederates basically you know, massacred, slaughtered a bunch of them simply because they were African-American. So here's, here's uh, a quote from a former Confederate who was at Fort Pillow. Our men were so exasperated by the Yankees' threats of no quarter that they gave but little. The slaughter was awful. Words cannot describe the scene. The poor, deluded Negroes would run up to our men, fall on their knees, and with uplifted hands scream for mercy. But they were ordered to their feet and then shot down. The white men fared but little better. The fort turned out to be a great slaughter pen. Blood, human blood, stood about in pools and brains could have been gathered up in any quantity. I, with several others, tried to stop the butchery and at one time had partially succeeded, but General Forrest ordered them shot down like dogs and the carnage continued. Finally, our men became sick of blood and the firing ceased. So this is a Confederate sergeant who was at Fort Pillow saying, yes, in fact, we Confederate troops did in fact, you know, uh, needlessly slaughter Union soldiers at Fort Pillow simply because they were African American. We have 16 members of the U.S. colored troops throughout the course of the war who received the Medal of Honor. That's, the, of course, the, even today the, highest, uh, the nation's highest award for military valor. 
Um, so 16 U.S. Colored Troops received the Medal of Honor. This is, these are three of them. Uh, Sergeant Major Christian Fleetwood on the left. Uh, Sergeant William H. Carney, who actually was at Fort Wagner uh, on the, uh, in the middle, and then Corporal Andrew Jackson Smith there on the end. So, so uh, several U.S. colored troops, very highly decorated for bravery under fire during the, uh, during the war. And then what are the legacies of the U.S. colored troops? Well, uh, one of the legacies is, is, you know, right after the war, when the U.S. Army kind of, first of all, shrunk down because the vast majority of the soldiers fighting in the Civil War were volunteers. They were not professional soldiers. These aren't guys who, you know, were, were career military uh, men, not, you know, career soldiers. So the, U the, the U.S. Army shrinks very significantly back down to a force of only about 25 or 30,000 men after the Civil War. But some of these units are the so-called Buffalo Soldiers. You maybe have heard of these. These are uh, regiments of African-American cavalry who, after the war, deployed out back out to the Western frontier because, of course, now that the Civil War was over, the South was pacified, slavery was abolished, then the Union had to turn, the U.S. had to turn its sort of its eye back to conquering the West. And so a lot of the same guys that we really revere for fighting for the United States during the Civil War uh, and, and putting down the Southern Rebellion and, and helping abolish slavery were then redeployed back out to the West and, and became, frankly, uh, unfortunately, very efficient at, at killing American Indians. Um, and probably the one of the best examples of that is William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, very, very famous, very revered, rightfully so, for, for you know, the march to the sea and, and, and all this stuff during the Civil War. Uh, and then, you know, of course, was also very efficient at, at, at pacifying American Indians or killing Am American Indians or pushing American Indians onto reservations uh, in the West after the war ended. And I just think of Sherman simply because I know that yesterday was his, uh, his birthday. So <laughs> he was born uh, 202 years ago yesterday. So, uh, so I, 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 that's the only reason I had Sherman in my head. So anyway, the, 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 civil, the, the Buffalo Soldiers after the Civil War are one of the legacies of the U.S. colored troops. Uh, these are, again, serving primarily on the western frontier. Uh, and near and dear to our heart, down the street, these are also some of the, the nation's first park rangers. Uh, there were national parks created long before we, the National Park Service, existed. The first national park was cre created in 1872. That was Yellowstone. Uh, but the National Park Service wasn't created until 1916. So we have decades there where we have parks, but really nobody to work in and care for the parks. And so a lot of times, the government ended up sending the army into parks to prevent poaching, to prevent illegal grazing, this kinds of thing. And this included Buffalo Soldiers. So we have Buffalo Soldiers who were some of the, the really unofficially some of the nation's first park rangers in some of the great western parks like Yellowstone and Yosemite, places like that. Of course, since the Civil War, uh, African Americans have served in, in con continuously in the military since then. They have fought in every conflict the United States has been involved in since the Civil War, uh, including the Spanish-American War, which is when this photo was, uh, was taken. So you see some, some African American troops here who are, are, are either in Cuba or about to deploy to Cuba uh, to fight the Spanish during the uh, the rather brief Spanish-American War in, in 1898. But the, you know, the, the, the tradition of African-American military service continues today, all the way up through you know, Iraq and Afghanistan and all the more recent conflicts. Uh, what about uh, uh, the military academies? Uh, the first African-American cadet at West Point was admitted in 1870, a guy named James W. Smith. He did not graduate. He didn't stay at West Point. So in 1877, the gentleman there on the left, Henry O. Flipper, became the first uh, African-American graduate of West Point. Uh, and, so, and then he served for the next five or six years as, as, a, as a military officer, as a West Point graduate. Shockingly, and I did not know this until I put this PowerPoint together, the, the U.S. Naval Academy, because there were, uh, even though I've talked primarily about soldiers here, there were African-American sailors in the Navy during the Civil War. Annapolis, the U.S. Naval Academy, did not have an African American graduate until 1949, after world, you know, several years after the end of World War II, and that's Wesley A. Brown uh, right here, the the smaller photo you see at the bottom there. He was the first African American uh, graduate of the uh, Naval Academy. He went on to serve over 20 years, fought in Korea and Vietnam uh, as a uh, as a career naval officer. <clears throat> 
And then this is the, uh, the African American Civil War Memorial in Washington, D.C., administered by us, the National Park Service. Uh, and uh, this was only erected about, I'm going to say, a little over 20 years ago. So I think it's the late 1990s or so. So this is a fairly recent uh, addition to all of the many statues and memorials that we, uh, that we are used to seeing in Washington, D.C. But this is, uh, this is in D.C. And, and is administered by us, the National Park Service. So. so next month, we will be here. It won't be me. It'll be another member of our staff. I believe the topic is the Jewish American experience in the Civil War, which is... is a very interesting topic as well. So if you can be here, uh, whatever the second Wednesday of, of March is uh, next month, we'll see you then. So. The ninth also. Oh, also the ninth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat>